Thanks for coming out, guys. This is awesome. I can't believe all of you are here to see me. This is great. Um, oh, is it not on? It's on. You good? All right. Thanks, Kim and Kyle, for having me. I really, I'm glad this came to fruition after three years. You remembered me. That's great. Um, and thanks, Design Cloud. Uh, this space is awesome. I'm definitely going to come back and check out your events. Um, so my company is this company, Foundry. Um, I started about five years ago now. Um, the focus was uh, picture frames. And it's all made from reclaimed building materials. So everything um, that we do, the furniture, the frames, it's all um, salvaged wood. We try to source as locally as we can, but um, we do venture out into the country every now and then, you know, further out into the to the boondocks, if you will, and, and get crazy material from hoarders out in, <laughs> out in that area. Um, so, um, so yeah, at its core, we're doing custom picture framing. This is the shop. Um, we're on Division, 20, 2151 West Division. Um, and uh, it's a really humble little store right now. We've got showroom that's like maybe 400 square feet or something and it's just chock full of frames and weird antiques and ephemera and art um, things that we can frame uh, things that can furnish your house um, this is the the workshop here part of it anyway um, so in the back beyond the the gallery is is my workspace um, so it's a kind of hands-on you bring bring your ideas to us or we share ideas, collaborate, and um, make it from scratch right there in the back of the store. Um, and so here's a repeat of some of the, the pictures. But uh, the material itself, um, as I said, comes from hoarders and, and uh, uh, <laughs> sometimes total weirdos. I deal with, like, I mean, the type of people that collect old wood also are collecting uh, barns full of random antiques and, and just weird stuff that, you know, to, to uh, the naked eye, you wouldn't really see the value in, but these guys see, you know, a lot of value in it. And, and I do, too. I kind of I share a kinship with those guys. I, um, I mean, they, I, they supply my material, but... Uh, I also love just rusty junk, and I'm just totally drawn to anything dilapidated. So um, that kind of actually is where it all really started. The the reuse thing is as awesome as that is. I love you know I totally promote recycling. We're committed to using all reclaimed building material. But for me, at the core, it was just like as an artist being drawn to that material as my medium. So I. I just, I don't, it just was natural to start making furniture with it because um, I just love the character of old stuff. Uh, this is a pile of um, this U-Haul I got from a, I rented a U-Haul and filled it up for a thousand bucks from some dude out in the country just like who had all of this stuff in his house and in his garage. And there was probably twice as much that I couldn't take with me. Uh, and occasionally, thank you. <laughs> um, occasionally, actually, in the beginning, um, when I first when I first got into making frames, I was working at a um, at a frame shop called Foresighted. That's really my background. I've been doing custom framing forever, um, and Foresighted is a really cool shop. You guys should check it out if if. You I haven't been there. I see somebody shaking their head. Um, the owner there, Todd Mack, 
was really into, or really open to uh, creative collaboration with his employees. So um, basically I had the opportunity to make whatever I wanted and if he liked it enough, he would give it a shot, put it on the shelf and see, you know, see how it went. Um, and I was really big into having my own wood shop. When I, I moved to Chicago, I lived with uh, five guys in a house out in Albany Park. And they were all musicians. And I, I play music too, but they were all in bands. And like it was like, th stuff was happening all the time. And I didn't really have a lot of privacy in that house. And uh, the garage went up for rent. So you know, I talked to the landlord, rented the garage, and then just bought a, you know, a table saw on Craigslist for like 100 bucks and slowly set up a shop. And I think I got a picture of it in here somewhere. Um, I might have to go back. I'm getting off track. <laughs> this is the garage. Um, so, ba you know, basically every day when I got out of Foresighted, I went home and went into the garage and started just tinkering around like an old, old retired man. <laughs> um, I mean, that's, I think that's who I am at heart, really. I retired early. Um, but so I'd spend many hours in the garage uh, coming up with different ideas. This actual, all of this right here in front of the table is uh, one of my ideas that never actually got completed. But it was, uh, I was, and I mean, I love picking alleys. So I found a really cool old couch from the 60s. And I attempted to reconstruct it into a new couch. But I don't do upholstery. So that's where I kind of fell off. Um, <laughs> But um, that you know, it's kind of was a springing board for, for other things. I found some old doors, and since I worked in a frame shop already, and I knew how to you know making frames is like, like I mean, I could do it with my eyes closed, really, because I've been doing it for like ten years. So, um, but I took these old doors, I made some frames, and Foresighted was kind enough to put them up for sale, and they like you know flew off the shelves. So I just started making more, and that snowballed. <laughs> to where I could kind of step away from foresighted. I was working, you know, went from 40 hours to 20 hours, you know, and then like eventually was just um, it, like to the point of like having two full-time jobs almost where like I, I, I was doing well enough because I got it in some other shops that I really saw the potential for just making that career out of it. You know, not like getting rich, but like being able to pay my you know, $300 rent check or whatever, because I was living with five guys, remember? Um, and, uh, and yeah, I just basically quit my job and just started doing that and focusing on it. And um, we uh, started wholesaling to other shops. Um, I'm just going to wing it now because I'm already off track here. So um, this, from the garage, I went into a studio space in Garfield Park. Um, and I stepped up from the two-car garage to a 700-square-foot studio where I built out a big loft. And it was awesome, this like man cave. I can go hang out. And there's tons of other artists around all the time and other woodworkers. And it was a you know, great, great environment. And uh, I actually really miss, miss that a lot. But um, we, uh, you know, we, I, I had an intern for a while there. We started making, this is when I really started getting more into furniture. Um, through the frames, I, people contacted me and were interested in possibly you know, having a table made or something similar with painted material. Um, you know, and I've always been drawn to furniture making. I've actually, when I, let's see, how do I go back on this? Um, Wonderful. So let me skip back a little bit. Um, um, I come from a framing background. These places were where I got my start. You guys familiar with that? Uh, you know, I stepped it up from there to this place. Um, and then, you know, skip forward like five other frame shops. I actually worked for a place that specialized in, uh, they bid out all the jobs for Applebee's and Hula Hands. So all of that really cheesy memorabilia stuff, uh, that's what I did all day long. Like, <laughs> make a hundred little frames that were just going to get like literally drilled and screwed into the wall at Applebee's. <laughs> um, 
And, uh, and then from there, I got a job at a place called State of the Art. Um, this is all in Kansas City. Um, that's, where I'm, that's where I'm from. I moved to Chicago like maybe six years ago now. Um, but so in Kansas City, I worked for this place called State of the Art. And I worked with a guy named Jim Swetlick, who was a really <laughs> talented craftsman. And we had a full wood shop there. And he was really into milling his own material for his frames. So a lot of the framing we did there was not the traditional frame shops are buying material from distributors and manufacturers and then just cutting it down or sometimes even just ordering it joined and, and putting the glass in. So this guy, Jim, is, is a craftsman. And he had a full wood shop. We would mill maple into flat stock and different thicknesses and create frames for a lot of the art galleries in town doing different archival techniques and this is where i really kind of honed my craft but having access to that wood shop was where i first started making furniture i basically would stay after um you know for like six hours after work i'd go like get off at work at like six, go across the street to the liquor store, get a six pack, get a slice of pizza at the pizza place, and then go back into the shop and just hang out like all night and, and work on whatever. And, and actually, um, this is some of the first stuff I ever made. This is before I started really doing the, the reclaimed thing. Um, the screen here on the right actually slides up and down each of those panels and it locks in three different positions. So you can kind of like play around with your um, your space, your openness. Uh, this table is sort of reclaimed. All of the, the fabric-y, like, woven stuff you see in there is all magazines cut on a guillotine chopper, cut at, like, one-inch thickness, and then turned on their side so you see the paper edge, and then they're collaged into the tabletop. So it's recycled. It's all recycled magazines. I got them from the library. Um, and you know, this was just stuff I did for myself, just to, to uh, satisfy that urge to create, to make stuff. And that's, you know, that's really what it's like. I've always wanted to build stuff, even since I was a kid. I, you know, I mean, skateboard ramps, clubhouses, all that kind of stuff. You know, ham hammering a nail into a board is still like one of the most satisfying things that I can think to do. Like, if I didn't have anything else to do, and I had some nails and some wood and a hammer laying around, I would be entertained for hours. I mean, just, I don't know, that's a good feeling. If you guys are looking for a good stress reliever, it's, it's really, it's awesome. Uh, um, garage, garage, uh, studio. Uh, so back to the wholesale thing. Um, you know, after, after making furniture um, for myself, Starting the garage, selling some frames, the next logical step was to try and actually sell some of my furniture. So we did an event at uh, the Merchandise Mart called Beckman's. And this is a really hokey, um, I hope nobody from Beckman's is here, um, but it's really like traditional like grandma kind of wicker basket craft stuff. Um, and it, you know, we stuck out like a sore thumb. So um, we actually did really well at that event. We, it was great. Um, and I still, have, I still have some clients now. This was like four years ago. And I still have clients now that I, that I serve that I met at, at that event. So um, that's the wholesale side of this is really what launched the company. Um, so if there's anybody out there that's a crafter that, you know, is thinking of different ways to really kind of get your name out there and get started, there's nothing, like wholesale for me was great. I mean, you, you're you underselling, you know, you're cutting your costs or whatever, but you're getting bulk payment, which is always nice. And it's like free advertising. This stuff sits on stores, shelves, and um, thousands of people walk past them. They're in windows on the sidewalk. I mean, like, it really is a, a great way to just kind of spread, spread your name. So think about it. Um, so going back to the, the furniture stuff, um, basically, it's all made from reclaimed material now. Um, and it's all my concepts. We do a lot of commission work. Um, but really, it's, it's a collaboration and leaning more towards what I want to do, for the, for the most part. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm, try, I'm really trying not to be a fabricator. Like, I do have customers that bring in examples of pieces that they really like and, and style that you know they're into, and, that, and that's very helpful in coming up with designs for people. Um, but for the most part, I, I want to be, like, m my passion is just to, to make the designs that I create. Like, it really, a big part of what I love about the furniture making process is the, the concept. It's sitting down with a ruler and graph paper and drafting it out. I, I've got sketchbooks full of stuff that I'll, I'll probably never, ever make, but I, I kind of just meditate that way. Like I sit down with my graph paper and, and draw different ideas, and, and that's how I begin. Each of these processes started with, with a sketch. Um, well, I shouldn't say that. Sometimes I'll just wing it and, and just make something. Like this piece here was for a company called Seagrass out in Winnetka. And um, she wanted a sofa table. And I had this, this is painter scaffolding. I had that laying around. I had these, this metal bracket laying around and a bunch of old wood. And I just kind of, I did, you know, did some sketches, but then I really just kind of that was, uh, this is nothing like what my sketches were like. I mean, it's just, I just kind of like threw it together and it turned out really nice. I mean, the client was happy, so I'm happy. Um, and everybody's happy, so. Uh, um, so the, the other pieces here, this is like mosaic, um, mosaic tabletop with salvage wood. This is a drawer face. One of the things we'll do a lot is, um, use old panels from the inside of doors um, as door faces. It's a great material. Um, it's already already routed out. It has that nice bevel to it. And uh, it typically works really well as a drawer. So it's one of the one of the things I really love to do is incorporate panels into drawer faces. The other piece on the right there is like a hanging wall shelf with wooden brackets. And this is something, one of my resources, which I'll, I'll give away, is the Rebuilding Exchange. Does anybody know that place? Yeah, they're great. Um, this is something I bought there um, when they were down on the south side on 47th Street. Um, but uh, yeah, that place is awesome. If you haven't checked that out, please check it out. Um, and uh, let's see. So beyond doing commissioned furniture, we are now getting into commercial work. So we've kind of branched out from, I mean, the progression was selling in one place, wholesale prices, picture frames, and that turned into many wholesale clients, which turned into having a custom frame shop, which turned into getting commissions for furniture, which is now turned into doing commercial projects. So um, we've kind of like really spread ourselves out as far as different revenue streams, and I think that that's essential if you're going to start a business in today's market like you have to be able to find new ways for just a little bit of money to come from a lot of different directions and that's all you that's all you really need um, this is anti taco we did all the bar and the the tables in there beautiful restaurant really amazing tacos um, oh I don't want to talk about what I know yet. Let's go back. Um, I don't really, I don't know anything. So, um, the framing process. I feel like I should touch on that. So, um, basically, how many of you have framed anything in your life? Gone into a frame shop. Okay. Um, you bring your art in, and um, you know you've got the same molding that any other frame shop has, they all buy from the same distributors. And um, it's basically, you know, not that you can't get beautiful work done, um, but we kind of have a different take on it. So all of the stock that we carry mostly is cut from old uh, salvage doors. So we specifically try and source doors that are um, really textured, heavily painted, heavily weathered and all naturally weathered. We don't do any sort of faux finishing. Um, so these doors, 
have a lot of solid wood and a lot of character to them. We cut them up, and uh, it's quite a process, actually. They're broken into pieces, ripped on the table saw into sections like these guys on the bottom right there, um, and then chopped uh, and, and joined together to whatever thickness or size we need for, for the particular framing project. Um, but um, you would actually be, when you bring your art in, we take a lot of time in designing the, uh, the framed piece to, to match the colors of the art, and you'd actually be really surprised these colors I'm, we're talking about doors from you know, the 1960s to the 1930s and even older sometimes, like late 1800s. They've been painted you know, a thousand different times and you can really see the different uh, color pattern, the, 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 the uh, motifs throughout the generations. So you know, we've got a lot of pink and fuchsia and you know, kind of 70s like faded green and uh, you know you, you really get a sense of the era in which they came from by just seeing the color um, and when you put it on the art it really comes to life I mean the colors the the different the different textures of the wood and the color really work well with we do a lot of screen prints we frame a lot of screen printing and the the colors really match the, the the faded color of the door really matches the um, the kind of low hue quality of the screen print. So that I think has been one of our our number one things is, is framing screen prints, just because of those the color palette that we find a lot in this old this old material. This really really works with it. Um, but so beyond once we pick out the frame, I mean basically you know we. We create the frame from, we have the doors in stock and we built, we mill it all uh, right there in the wood shop and put it together and create a beautiful framed piece. Uh, Hobby Lobby, Michaels, fine art framing, furniture. Uh, okay, so let's get to what I know, which is really not much. Um, obviously, um, but so I'm still like learning a, a lot. I mean, this is like every day, like owning your own business is like a, a big lesson. I know a lot of you are graphic designers, but I think you can relate to this if you're thinking about going freelance. Um, you are stepping out on a limb. You are not getting a round number every two weeks, you know, or every whatever your pay increment is, you're, it's, it's every day. It could be a, a $1,000 paycheck or you know, nothing. You know? I mean, it's like weeks of being up in the air a lot of times, um, not really knowing what's coming in. And you have to really budget. You have to um, be able to kind of live that way and deal with the uncertain. Um, it's, it's rather scary sometimes. Uh, I think I'm starting to deal with the stress more as we get a little more established, but um, it, it can be very stressful. So um, I'm not trying to discourage you, I guess. I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, I'm just being real, I guess. You know, it's, it's, it's freaking hard. I mean, like it's, I don't know. It, some days are really easy. Some days are great. I think for me, like the biggest thing, the biggest piece of knowledge that I need to continually remind myself is to um, to be aware of why I'm doing what I'm doing. Like, why am I freaking out about the bills and all concerned about the bureaucratic red tape and, and bullcrap behind the business? I mean, obviously, I'm doing that because you have to be concerned about it. But in the end, I got into into doing what I'm doing because I just want to, I just want to build. I want to be in my shop. I want to make things, and I don't necessarily want to be in a nine to five, working hard and selling my creative ideas to for somebody else's benefit. You know, I want to own them and and do it for myself. So, um, it's 
it's really important to remind yourself of that a lot. I find myself losing track of that and not, um, not focusing on the creative side as much as I should. Like every time I get stressed out, if I just go into the shop and just you know pick a sketch or just come up with an idea based on whatever I've got laying around, I I'm instantly reminded. So it becomes it becomes like a meditation and just making you refocus and reconnect with the sole purpose of why you started a company in the first place to be independent and creative. That's why I did it. So um, I don't, the shark, I don't know. <laughs> I like it. I feel like this shark sometimes. I, <laughs> it's, yeah, I think I can be pleasant to be around most of the time, but when I turn into the shark, it's not, it's not good. Um, get dirty, and that's a literal, get dirty, like go out and, and root around in the garbage, please, everybody, um, and find something interesting, um, and make something out of it, I, I mean, whatever you want, like a, a coat rack, uh, a, I mean, you probably wouldn't want to make a butcher block out of something from the garbage, but, um, <laughs> I don't know anything, a shoe rack, whatever. Uh, they're just hanging on the wall, you know? I mean, there's a lot of usable material out there that gets discarded every day, thousands and thousands of pounds of stuff, you know, that if somebody has the initiative to actually just consider for a moment, like, what could this be? You know, there's probably a hundred different concepts of what it could be. Not all of them will be a successfully marketed thing, but maybe, you know, I mean, we're all artists here, right? We can, can just make art for art's sake, right? And that's a good, a good reason to save something from being tossed away. Um, so get dirty. Spread the love. Um, this refers to the community of being creative, being artists. Uh, for me, I am constantly talking about um, other people that are doing similar work that I'm doing, um, people that we carry in the shop screen printers, um, other, other crafts people. I think that it's important to, to really share and, and tell others about things that you like and people that are really, I mean, if, if it wasn't for other artists liking my stuff, I wouldn't have been doing this at all, you know? So it's, it really starts with, critiquing yourself and then sharing it with other people and then critiquing their stuff and being a part of that conversation and, and just really spreading it around and telling everybody you know. I mean, it can't hurt, it comes back around. So, you know, just, just be each other's promoter. Um, and on, <laughs> this, okay, this is have an, <laughs> This, basically, you should do something else besides, even, even doing um, you know, what I love to do for a living, I still I come home at night and you know, I, the last thing I want to do is really think about work or do, you know, think about the project I have to get done the next day. Um, I have to have some sort of outlet. So you know, for me, it's playing music and training my cats how to play banjo. Um, <laughs> But I think that that's, you know, that's really important for sanity. I mean, obviously, working a nine to five, you can't just like come home and like bring, bring all of that stress and anxiety home with you. You know, you have to have a separate outlet. And, um, you know, f for me, I worked in, you know, a pretty lax environment, but I still wanted to do my own thing. And when it became my own thing, that's when there's, you know, I started getting, a lot, a lot more stress about because now it's all riding on me. So music, I've always played music, and like now it's become my my outlet. Like when I want to stop thinking about Foundry and I want to just, you know, just do something creative for creative sake that has no monetary gain at all or no connection to the business. Um, you know, just play some music, hang out. You know, see, write a song. I don't know. Whatever, if it could be painting, could be you know, but you have to have that outlet. Could be improvising, could be um, 
Uh, I don't know, inventing? Are there any inventors here? <laughs> I think. Yeah, no inventors? Oh. Time machines, people, we need them. Um, and yeah, this is, I'm gonna wrap it up here with this. This is basically just do it. Like, if you're scared, that's probably good. If you're not, if you're not scared, that's probably bad, is what I should say. Because to jump out and to work on your own, um, there's a huge leap of faith, and you have to trust that the product that you're creating is, is valuable enough to, to sustain whatever your goals are. So the only way to find that out is to really just to, to do it. I mean, you, you, there is no other alternative. Like if, if you're going to make it happen, you, at some point you just have to decide to, to try it. Um, and actually, that's something I've, I think I learned early on about myself is that I wanted to own my own business eventually. And I knew that if I didn't try it, I would regret it for forever. You know, I wouldn't, like, I don't want to hold on to that, get to the end of, you know, laying on my deathbed and thinking, like, why didn't I try that? That I had that idea that one time, it would have been a good idea, and then somebody else is doing it now, or whatever, you know, I mean, you just gotta trust yourself and go for it. And uh, if it doesn't work out, um, I don't know, there's always homeless shelters or, you know, busking. <laughs> okay, that's it. Thanks, guys.